Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dear viewers, in the previous sessions, uh, we have uh, taken a critical look at the collection of the Quran narrative which has been uh, recorded in Bukhari and which shows and which says that there was an official collection of the Quran uh, which was made after the death of the Prophet in the times of the, Abu, uh, the Caliph Abu Bakr. And the Prophet did not lead, uh, leave behind an official codex or an officially collected Quran. However, it was the Caliph Abu Bakr who, at the advice of uh, Umar, anhu, went about collecting the Quran. And he had advised Zayd ibn Sabit uh, to do so. And finally, uh, Zayd ibn Sabit have collected the Quran through various sources and compiled it in the form of a mushaf. We had critically evaluated this uh, account, which is recorded in the Al Jami al Sahih of Imam Bukhari. Uh, in this session, uh, viewers, I would like you. Uh, I would like to summarize the arguments or the uh, critique that we have already seen in detail uh, in the previous sessions. I'd like to just concisely state these arguments or this critique, uh, so that uh, we are able to gauge, in a nutshell, what exactly uh, is uh, the criticism. Uh, which this uh, narrative entails. Remember that we are talking about this narrative as has been recorded by in the Al-Jami al-Sahih of Imam Bukhari and we have observed that it is also recorded in uh, other uh, collections. Uh, and uh, this particular uh, critique also is based on the details of uh, the narrative recorded by Imam Bukhari. But obviously it's not just confined to Imam Bukhari's uh, uh, version of the narrative. Uh, it, it applies to all other versions as well. Now, uh, the first cr uh, criticism which this uh, narrative calls is that uh, we find that the nature of the event is such that it should have been reported by a large number of individuals. We know that uh, the narrative says that it was the Battle of Yamama which took place in the times of the Caliph Abu Bakr in which a result, uh, that we find a lot of uh, uh, Hufas or the memorizers of the Quran who had been martyred and seeing this situation and this scenario, Umar anhu was alarmed and he came to Abu Bakr and he said that uh, if this, things go on like this, then we have a, have, have a large part of the Quran lost. So therefore he advised him that we should have the written collection of the Quran and the way it was reported we find that if such an event had uh, taken place, it should have been uh, recorded variously by various companions because obviously this whole task should could not have been taken it could not have taken place in isolation it should have it would have taken place uh, in the presence of people who would have uh, gone about uh, in accomplishing this task now on the other hand we find that this narrative is is reported in a very weak manner and when i say weak i refer to the technical term of gharib which means that there is only one narrator in the first tier who reports it and uh, not only this uh, we find that the first three steps of the first three tiers have only one narrator. So we have Zayd ibn Sabit reporting this narrative. Then we have Ubaid ibn Sabak reporting this narrative from Zayd. And then we have Ibn Shahab Zori reporting uh, from uh, Zayd ibn Sab, uh, from Ubaid ibn Sabak. So not only is this uh, narrative reported uh, in, uh, as a gharib narrative, and of course when you say a gharib narrative, it means a narrative in which in any step of the chain of narration, there is just one narrator. So it's not just in one step, as I said, in the first three steps, we find that there, is, there are single individuals who are reporting this narrative. And this obviously is something very, very strange and calls for a question that uh, how is it that a task which was obviously, uh, which took place, which should have to taken place, uh, the way it has been reported. Uh, and uh, the nature of the event is such, the nature of this collection is such that it should have been reported in the first year by many people, not, by, by, not just by Zayd ibn Sabit. But we find that this is not the case. And as I said, after him as well, in the next two steps too, we find just single individuals reporting it. Now this is compounded by the fact, this, this whole scenario is compounded by the fact then the, that some of the uh, other history books, uh, other hadith books, uh, some uh, very primary hadith books uh, do not report this narrative at all. Thus, for example, uh, the Al-Jami al-Sahih of Imam Muslim and uh, al the Mu'atta of Imam Malik, both are absolutely devoid uh, of this narrative. As far as Imam Muslim's Al-Jami al-Sahih is concerned, we find sections and chapters which devote uh, themselves to the 
to, to things which relate to the Quran and one would find Imam Muslim uh, to have uh, reported this narrative uh, at that particular section in that particular section in which he reports other reports regarding the uh, Quran but we do not find them and we also need to note the fact that Imam Muslim reports narratives uh, which have uh, Imam Zohri which is, the, uh, which is the focal point of this narrative and also uh, we also find that Imam Muslim's uh, conditions for accepting a report are slightly less stringent than that of Imam Bukhari. So it's strange that why did not Imam Muslim re record this narrative at all. And as far as the Matta of Imam Malik is concerned, there too we find a section uh, which relates to the Quran, but this narrative is not found there. And uh, as if uh, another thing which can be added to this is, uh, of course we are discussing the first point, the first critique, and that is the weak nature of the reporting. The, the, uh, the nature that we would consider to be all embracive is not there. So we found that the narrative was uh, reported by, in the first three tiers by just a couple of single individuals. Then we, and then to compound this fact, we found that uh, perhaps maybe because of this reason, Imam Muslim did not even record this narrative. Uh, in his uh, Al Jami Al Sahih, and neither the, the, the Imam, uh, neither Imam Malik in his Al Mu'atta. Now, continuing with this fact, we also find that this narrative does not exist in one of uh, in some of the earliest books of history. And uh, amongst uh, these earliest books of history, the most important is the Tabqat al uh, Tabqat al Kubra of uh, Muhammad ibn Sa'ad. And this is something which is uh, very very strange because. The tabaqat is arranged in a manner in which we find the biographies of people, uh, of the earliest people uh, being mentioned there. We have the biography of all the people who figure in this narrative recorded there. Thus we have Abu Bakr's biography, we have Omar's biography, we have, when I say biography, I uh, refer to bi biographical notes, short notes on these uh, individuals. So, and we have also uh, biographies of uh, Hafsa. And then we have the biography of Zayd ibn Sabit. So all the four main people which are mentioned in this narrative, we have short, bio, at times short and at times lengthy biographical notes on these personnel. And none, uh, there's no place in these uh, biographical notes do we find that any of these four individuals had any role in the collection of the Quran. And this makes things even more grave when you find that details which are very insignificant at times, which seem very insignificant or trivial, they are mentioned in their biographical notes. So the question arises that why do not their biographical notes mention that Abu Bakr or Umar عنهم, or Hafsa to whom these, this uh, Musaf was transferred after the death of uh, Umar as the narrative says. And again the central character is Ayad ibn Sabit. In, in all these biographical notes we do not find any mention of the fact that these people had any role of collecting the Quran. Again, uh, I had also referred to the fact that uh, uh, earlier histories, uh, which not only Tabqad ibn Saad, but uh, 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 histories such as uh, Ibn Qutayba al-Ma'arif, also, who, who is uh, one of the earliest historians, although he's uh, just after uh, Ibn Saad, but again, his al-Ma'arif also mentions biographical notes of these four personnel. And again, uh, this time we find, uh, this time also we find that there's no mention of uh, these people's roles uh, in the collection of the Quran. And similar is the case with the Tariq of At-Tabri. So tari Tabri's Tariq is, is, a, is a monumental, is a voluminous work uh, on the history of Islam. And lo and behold, here again, we do not find any mention of the collection of the Quran uh, that has, uh, this, that is a narrative of Bukhari reports that it, it had taken place in the times of the Caliph Abu Bakr. So all in all, in this first point, this first critique, we can clearly see that the nature of the transmission of this report is extremely frail and uh, this is compounded by the fact that the, uh, two of the important books of Hadith, the uh, Imam Muslim al Jami Sahih and the Mu'atta Imam Malik are devoid of this report and also we find that uh, very early his Muslim histories like the Tabqat of Ibn Sa'ad and then uh, the Tariq of Tabari and uh, Ibn Qutayba as al Ma'arif and there are a couple of other books as well which belong to the same era in which this uh, narrative has also not been mentioned uh, or any, any sort of mention regarding a collection of the Quran being uh, uh, taken place in the time of Abu Bakr has not been mentioned. So this whole uh, scenario casts serious doubt 
uh, regarding the historicity of this narrative and it is uh, it is it, it makes it very suspect that this narrative would have taken place we have we have to note the fact viewers that uh, this narrative tells us that it was as a result of the battle of yamama in which a lot of memorize of the quran had been martyred that this event had uh, later called or at least alarmed uh, umar ta'ala anhu to come over to uh, abu bakr and give this advice so uh, obviously uh, this this thing is is uh, the way it has been reported in this uh, in history and in in, in um, these books is very very weak and very very frail it's a very very feeble transmission now next uh, we go on to the next uh, critique or the next point of criticism the second point and in this uh, particular point I'll, uh, we, uh, we have discussed in our earlier sessions that uh, the collected quran seems to be a personal endeavor uh, whereas the narrative itself gives us this impression that it was an official collection. Obviously, Abu Bakr in the capacity of a caliph had, had went about doing it and Omar had come to him uh, when he saw uh, a number of martyrs being, uh, a number of people being martyred in the Battle of Yamama. So the whole, and, uh, and his summoning of Zaid ibn Sabit and asking him to do so, this whole uh, scenario gives us the impression that it was an official collection and when it was an official collection, then of course it should have that status that the, it should have belonged to the state and it should have been uh, treated as a state collection. But uh, there are at least two good reasons uh, which tell us that this was not the case. The first is we know that the uh, narrative mentions the fact that the collected Quran after the times of Abu Bakr was passed on to Umar and then after his death it was passed on to his daughter Hafsa. So why was a official Quran, of officially collected Quran, passed on to uh, Umar's daughter Hafsa. It should have been, it should have passed on to the next caliph. And if the argument is that the next caliph or the uh, selection of the next caliph was, had been delegated to a, a committee of six members who were supposed to elect the, one among them, the argument could have been made, the point could have been made that this collected Quran should have been consigned to those six people and whoever was the, uh, whoever was finally made the caliph then it should have gone to him. But on, on the other hand, we find it ending up in the <coughs> custody of Umar's daughter Hafsa, who obviously had no role in the state affairs. Not only that, we find that in the times of uh, Caliph Usman, when he had actually asked uh, Hafsa Anha to hand Umar in the copy, so that he, uh, the collected Quran, so that he could make copies of that uh, collected Quran, uh, we find that Umar actually returning after making copy, uh, Usman returning that uh, those uh, that Musaf back to Hafsa, uh, which again uh, would be uh, something questionable that if it had belonged to the state in the first place, it should have not come to Hafsa, and if had it at least landed with Usman when he had asked for it to make uh, to make copies of it, then why did he return it back to Hafsa? After all, it was an official collection; he should have kept it. And we also find in some narratives that Hafsa had shown. Uh, some hesitation in handing over the uh, the mushaf to Usman, and she, he had to give him assurance, her assurance that he he'll hand it back, that she gave it to him. So all in all, this shows that it could not have been an official collection. It it was it was more of a personal endeavor. Not only this, the second point in this particular uh, critique is that we also find that this whole uh, endeavor seems to be of a, something of a uh, something which was never put to use. The collected Quran, what happened to the collected Quran? It was consigned to oblivion, it seems, because we find that people uh, were never uh, were not, not offered this Quran for that. For example, they could have uh, come forward and written their own copies from this Quran. They were not stopped uh, in writing their own Qurans or memorizing the way they were originally doing. Uh, this collected Quran seems to have played no role. We find that in the Caliph uh, Umar's role, uh, uh, reign especially, uh, which was which spanned 10 years he had made extensive efforts to disseminate the quran he had hired people on stipends uh, who were the memorizers who were people who would teach the quran and we never find them uh, using this this uh, this collected quran so it seems that it it fell in disuse and such was the nature of this disuse that in the times of the caliph usman when he called for the copy and he had this checked uh, he found that there was one verse or Zayd ibn Sabit obviously on his behalf found that there was a single verse which was not found in that collected Quran which shows that that particular Mus'haf 
had not been put to use, it had not been read, otherwise this mistake would have come to the fore. It was totally kept in oblivion in the two years of uh, Abu Bakr's um, caliphate and in the ten year or uh, eight year period, eight or ten year period of Caliph Umar, again it was not used uh, because it was only in the times of the Caliph Usman when it was once again uh, read by Zayd ibn Sabit that he found it, uh, that a verse was missing. And as I said, people, were, uh, people, had, people seemed to have no role in having any access to the collected Quran. Neither did the two caliphs made any effort to put this Quran in use, nor did people come forward, nor were people stopped in the rest of the empire to not, uh, to not uh, go about their own Qurans, but to at least have some connection, some connection with this collected official Quran. So this never was the case. So this casts serious doubt on the fact that what exactly uh, was the role of this Quran when in the first two uh, caliphs reigns, it was never used. So this is the second critique uh, which we can present on this, uh, in this, whole, uh, on this whole collection episode as recorded by our Hadith books. Coming to the third point of criticism, uh, this third point of criticism uh, relates to the fact that we find that there are certain contradictions which, uh, which result if we accept this narrative. Uh, if you recall, uh, we had discussed that this narrative has various uh, versions, it has variants. So these variants tell us, uh, these variants tell us that uh, when Zayd ibn Sabit had gone about collecting the Quran, uh, he, he used various sources like parchment, like uh, bones, like the memories of men, all sorts of things. And he collected all of the Quran he, and he said that he had he collected every bit of the Quran and he also stresses the fact as is mentioned in these narratives that the, the last two verses of Surah Tawba were found with only a single individual and the variants name different people for the single individual. Some of the variants say it was Abu Khuzayma, some others say it was Khuzayma. Some say it was Haris ibn Khuzayma, some say it was Haris ibn Khuzayma, some others don't even mention and just say Rajulum al Ansar, uh, as people, a person among the Ansar. And in some narratives, we find that the person who's reporting, he says that he's not even sure whether it was uh, Khuzayma or Abu Khuzayma. So even if we disregard some of the minor uh, people, or some of the people who are mentioned in a, in a minor way, we can clearly see that uh, most narratives uh, are say that it was either Abu Khuzayma or Khuzayma. So let us see what the contradictions are when either of these two people is supposed to be the person with whom the last two verses of Surah Tawba were found. For example, let's see if the person who, with whom these last two verses of Surah Tawba were found was Abu Khuzayma. Now the first question which arises is that if he was the person who, with whom the last two verses were found, then where was Khuzayma ibn Sa'ad uh, ta'ala anhu? Because it is with him that uh, we, he, he had actually come forward in the times of the Caliph Usman and said that look here, there are two, there is a verse of Surah Azab which is missing. And then he presented that uh, verse of Surah Azab uh, at that time. So uh, if, Abu, if Zayd ibn Sabit was collecting the Quran and he, has, he said that only one verse was, uh, was found with uh, Abu Khuzayma, then Khuzayma ibn Sabit, why didn't he come forward and say that he too had another verse because that verse supposedly was never reported in this Quran, never recorded. It, it was recorded uh, uh, two decades later in the times of the Caliph Usman. So why didn't he come forward or why, didn't he, why, why wasn't he called? So this is a question that arises in, um, if the narrative is Abu Khuzayma. Another thing that uh, arises in this fact is that if he was uh, Abu Khuzayma, then uh, we find that Zayd stressing the fact that he had found all verses of the Quran with people except one, uh, except two verses uh, of Surah Tawbah with just one person. Now, if he was correct in this regard, then uh, it should automatically have meant that there was no other verse which had gone missing. But we find, as I said earlier on, that the missing verse of Surah Azab were found in the times of um, Caliph Usman. So why is it that uh, if, Usma, if Zayd's claim was true, it could have been either true or false. If it would have been false, it's uh, another matter, but it was true. This should have mean that uh, he was absolutely sure that there was just two verses who were missing, which was found with a single individual. But it seems that this collected Quran was not even checked if Abu Khuzayma was the person, because obviously if it's not checked, then uh, it was only because of this lack of checking that we can say 
that, that uh, the absence of another verse was diagnosed many years later. And finally, again, if we think that Abu Khuzayma is the person with whom these last verses of Surah Tawbah were found, then another question arises is that we know that in the times of the Caliph Usman, when Zaid ibn Sabit was uh, again involved in ha having the uh, Quran copied out, he had insisted that, uh, that or the narratives mention that he had, uh, he, that the last verse, of, that one of the verses of Surah Ahzab that were found in him were accepted by Zaid because Khuzayma ibn Sabit carried the weight of two witnesses. Now, in the case of Abu Khuzayma, if we come back to the times of Abu Bakr, as we were discussing, if he, he was the person with whom these missing verses were found, then why did Zaid ibn Sabit not insist that two witnesses should be there? Because in the times of the Caliph Usman, he accepted uh, Khuzayma, uh, Khuzayma's uh, verse uh, of Surah Azab, uh, as he, which he presented, because Khuzayma had the weight of two witnesses. But this was never the case with Abu Khuzayma. So we find this inconsistent attitude by Zayd ibn Sabit. In the case of Usman, it was accepted by a person who had double the weight of a witness. So therefore, another person was not called. However, in the case of uh, Abu Bakr's times, it was, if it was just Abu Khuzayma, then why is it that not another person was called? Because it is generally said, uh, it was reported as we shall uh, see, and we have already seen in the detailed discussion that two, uh, two witnesses were required for the collection. So this again is a contradictory attitude that we find being displayed by Zayd ibn Sabit. And if someone says that Zayd himself was the second witness, then again this cannot be accepted because in the case of uh, uh, Khuzayma ibn Sabit, when he insisted in the times of uh, the Caliph Usman that there had to be two witnesses, uh, he could himself have presented the second witness when uh, obviously he was uh, not there. Okay, uh, this is how we have analyzed the first uh, assumption uh, that the narrative, uh, the, the last verses of uh, Surah Tawbah were found with Abu Khuzayma. Now let's uh, imagine the other scenario. And the other scenario is that the, these last verses were found with Khuzayma ibn Sabit. Now if this is the case, then the question becomes, then the whole issue becomes even more grave and even more strange and eerie. Because if Khuzayma was the person with whom these last verses of Surah Tawbah were found, then it is just ob very obvious that he was, should have also said because he had been identified. It was from him that these last two verses of Surah Tawbah uh, were found. He could have just said, look here, that we, I have another verse which Zayd you have not collected and that is the missing verse of Surah Ahzab, which we know that it was only in the times of the Caliph Usman that he had come forward. Khuzayma ibn Sabit had come forward and said, okay, I have another verse of, which was not recorded and that was the verse of Surah Ahzab. So it is ex extremely strange, viewers, extremely strange that a person who says uh, with whom the last two verses of Surah Tawba were found, they were recorded, and that was the end of that. But suddenly we find out that in 20 years later, the same person had come forward and said, look here, I have another verse which is not recorded. Obviously, we would, we would have expected him to present that verse which was uh, missing at the time of the Caliph Usman, the Surah Azab verse, right at the time of Abu Bakr, when he was the person with whom the Surah Tawba verse was found. So he could have said, okay, I have another verse as well, as well. please record it. This never happened. And viewers, we also need to uh, uh, underscore the fact that there, were, there are some other minor contradictions as well. This contradic these contradictions which I have just pointed out result if we assume either Abu Khuzayma or Khuzayma to be the person uh, with whom these missing verses were found. But then we have other narratives as you would recall when I was uh, giving the detailed critique that we find, uh, in, ge in, in, in general terms, we find that the missing verses of Surah Tawbah, I would say, when I say general terms, that most of the narratives refer to the fact that the missing verses of Surah Tawbah uh, were found at the time of the collection of Caliph Abu Bakr, Ritala Anhu. However, however, uh, most narratives speak that the missing verse which was found in the times of the Caliph Usman's collection was Surah Hazab. This is what the general consensus seems to be. But we, I have pointed out uh, narratives in my earlier discourse and my earlier critiques and my earlier sessions that there are some narratives which mention the reverse, absolutely the reverse. Thus, these narratives mention that the missing verse of Surah Ahzab was found in the time of the, of the Caliph Abu Bakr and the missing, verse and the, uh, missing verses of the time of, uh, of Surah Tawbah were found in the time of the Caliph Usman. And similarly, we have some other variations in this regard as well. So, uh, this is the third point of criticism in which we can clearly see, clearly see that there are some contradictions if we, if we assume who the person was with whom the last verses were found 
and obviously then these verses themselves also are questionable whether they, which of them were found in the time of Abu Bakr and which of them were found with uh, Caliph Usman's collection. So this is the third point of critique or the third point of criticism. Let me move on to the fourth point of criticism and the fourth point of the criticism is that the methodology which was adopted by, uh, by Abu Bakr seems not only to be questionable, it also seems to be insufficient. It was questionable and insufficient. It was questionable because the task itself seems to be a very monumental task. It seems to be a task in which several people should have been involved, should have uh, played their role because obviously the whole of the Quran was collected and we find just a single individual like Zaid ibn Sabit, uh, although he might have been competent. But the nature of the task, or the huge nature of the task required that more people should have been, uh, should have played their role in this and especially people who were uh, more involved in, uh, in the times of the Prophet who were the, the scribes perhaps, who had written the Quran and who were senior companions but they were not involved. Not only this, we also find that Abu Bakr never consulted the shura or the general people regarding what he was advised by Omar. It was just as if he, uh, Omar came to him with Allah and asked a certain, uh, certain task to be done and then he went about doing it. We, we find Abu Bakr in, in so many affairs in his own times that he would, he would consult the shura. He would consult people for all major decisions but here such a major decision as the collection of the Quran was never even put before the shura or the members uh, with whom he made consultation. So we, uh, the second part of this uh, critique is that, which I already uh, pointed out before, that uh, this, this methodology adopted by Abu Bakr was insufficient as well. In other words, this means that it was not sufficient, it would not have met the purpose for which it was uh, accomplished. And that is that the collected Quran was devoid of diacritics and vowel sounds, which means that it could not have distinguished between similar words like ra and za, and it could not have been properly pronounced in the absence of vowel sounds by people who were not hufas or, or memorizers. Because people who were converts, maybe people who were, had, did not have the whole of the Quran in their memory, they could not have uh, read the Quran or uh, made any uh, benefit or uh, extracted any benefit from it because of the fact that that Quran just had a skeletal text. So what use was this collection when people could not have read it, uh, people who were not memorizers, and we know that the complete memorizers of the Quran, although we had partial memorizers, we had complete memorizers, but of course people who were converts or people who did not memorize the Quran. So what use of this, what was the use of this collected Quran when the exact uh, sound of the Quran could not have been preserved? Because that skeletal text, as I said, was without diacritics. It was without, uh, with, it was without um, vowel sounds. So only the hufas, either the hufas would have been sufficient if more hufas had been, had been produced, if there was, a, there was a danger that the Quran was being lost, or at least some diacritics or even vowel sounds, if they had been put on that uh, skeletal text, that could have ensured. So that if these two methods had been adopted, we can say it was a, it was a sufficient methodology. But neither any hufas were engaged uh, neither was it said that we need more of us, let's, let's produce more of us, nor was this skeletal text, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, the skeletal text had any diacritic marks or vowel sounds so that it could be, uh, so it would be preserved the way it had been pronounced or it had been in read out. So we see that this is an insufficient methodology which was adopted by the Caliph Abu Bakr. So now, now let's move on to the fifth uh, point of criticism and uh, as far as this uh, fifth point of criticism is concerned, uh, recall the fact viewers that we had made a critical assessment of the fact that just as there is this standard version of the collection of the Quran which Abu Bakr uh, undertook, remember we had some secondary narratives, some other narratives as well which besides the standard version, if at all there is a standard version, they mentioned a different version of the first collection. So remember we had seen that there are at least four other versions which are different from the standard version. So one of these four versions was the one in which again, although it was Abu Bakr himself who was supported to be the first collector or, the, or responsible for the first collection, but the manner in which that 
uh, report is, is laid out or the, the events or the details or the content of this alternate collection, although it is Abu Bakr himself, but these reports are not only contradictory with the report, which say uh, the standard report, but also amongst themselves. So if we take all of these reports to be at par, if there is no standard version and these are they, these are other versions as well, and if we take them at par, and why do I say that we take them at par? I say that because uh, all of them have been critically uh, analyzed, and even if the isnad of a particular uh, of a particular report could have been slightly better, but I have shown in my critique that since all of them have been weekly reported, so therefore, if we place the standard version and if we place the other versions at par, we'll find them in absolute contradiction with one another. They'll just cancel out each other when we just cannot have any definite uh, inference as to what happened. So uh, I was saying that there is, uh, there is this alleged standard version which says that Abu Bakr was his first collector. Then we have another group of narratives in which although Abu Bakr is the first collector, but it, they have tremendous amount of discrepancies. There are a number of reports which mention him to be the first collect collector, but these reports have a different story of the first collection different from each other and different from the standard one. Then we have report, reports which say that it was Umar Anhu who was the first collector in his times. He was the person. These are reports which again contradict themselves. They have a number of flaws themselves. They also, they also have weak, uh, weak, weak chains of narration as is the case with the previous ones. And they also contradict the standard one and they also contradict one another. Then remember I pointed out that there was another report which says that the first collector was Usman Anhu. Again, that collection, collected report is uh, was stood on flimsy grounds as I had pointed out. Then there is another fourth first collector and he is Salim Mawla Abi Huzaifa. Salim Mawla Abi Huzaifa. His report is also reported in a very weak manner. So all in all we find various reports of the first collection all of them contradict one another, all of them present different details and if they all are kept at par as they should be because all of them have been weakly reported, then nothing can be made out as to what actually happened. And in the presence of this whole mass of uh, contradictory reports, we just cannot say that events happened the way they have been reported in these individual narratives. Now, uh, let's move on to the sixth point of criticism and that sixth point is that we also observed that uh, there, was, there was a secondary batch of narratives in which it was said that the Quran was collected with the help of two witnesses. The, its text was finalized with the help of two witnesses. We had uh, analyzed in that that all these reports again were contradictory. All of these reports were contradictory to one another. That the fact that uh, whether two witnesses were involved in the fact that uh, they already knew what, which the verses were, some said no. Uh, two witnesses were uh, were picked out on verses which were not known to Abu Bakr uh, to to Zaid ibn Sabit, and then we again have the fact that these uh, two witnesses uh, we never know what these two witnesses were. Historians or muhaddisun report their own interpretation as to what these two witnesses are, were. Some say that it, these these two witnesses were one was of kitaba written written uh, report, written corroboration and one was an oral corroboration others say that there were two people who testified that the verses they have brought forward were the ones that they had heard from the prophet or the prophet had written in the arzaya khira in short we have different people saying what these two witnesses meant so and these two witnesses if if the quran is accepted that it was finalized with the, with the help of these two witnesses then the manner in which these reports have been narrated in history as I had pointed out, it is such a frail and weak manner, in such a contradictory manner, that nothing can be made out of them. And lastly, if I would say, if, if it is accepted that two witnesses were actually involved, then as has been pointed out earlier, then this would be in dire contradiction to the fact that the claim of the Quran, that it is mutawatir, which means that a number of people in the first year had reported uh, the Quran, as is the case, as I'll, as I'll presently or in my future uh, discussions point two and later on. But if this is the case that only two witnesses were used to finalize the text of the Prophet, then it would be in entire contradiction with the fact that the Quran is mutawatir. So uh, now we move on uh, to some of the other points of contradiction. And the seventh point in this regard is that we had also seen 
that the, the, as far as the isnad of this narrative is concerned, uh, we had seen that in all probability that this, this narrative is munqata, it is broken, it has a broken chain of narration. And this is because Ubaid ibn Sabbaq, who reports from Zaid ibn Sabit, uh, we in all probability find that this report is, is broken from here. Because Imam Bukhari himself, who says this, this narrative, who regards this narrative, also has his own history, which is called a Tariqul Kabir, in which he records biographical information about narrators. And in that particular book, he does not regard uh, Zayd ibn Sabit to be a teacher of Ubaid ibn Sabbaq, nor in the, neither in the biography of uh, Zayd ibn Sabit, nor in that of Ubaid ibn Sabbaq. Both of them are devoid of the fact, uh, does not, they do not mention whether one of them was a student and the other than of, uh, one of them was, the, uh, was a teacher. So why is it that Imam Bukhari is supporting in one of his books, which is al Jami al-Sahih, that Zaid was the teacher of Ubaid and Ubaid was a student of Zaid in this particular report. But when he comes to his own book, Al-Tariq uh, uh, al-Kabir, in which he mentions the biographical accounts of, uh, of Zaid and of uh, Ubaid ibn Sabbaq, but he does not give uh, this, this mention that the two are students and one of them is a student and the other one is a teacher. So this is something very grave. And this is compounded by the fact that uh, some of the other books, like uh, like Al Jahb Al Tadil of Ibn Abi Hatim, that too, and of uh, and Al Tabqat Al Kubra of Ibn Saad, they too are devoid of the fact that uh, they mention that these two were student and teachers. So, in uh, in short, we find that none of the earlier books mention Zaid to be the informant of Ubaid Ibn Sabbaq, and this is corroborated by the earlier books. So, therefore, in all probability. This narrative is broken from here. Also, we have the fact that Zayd ibn Sabit had 40 students or 40 odd students which have been reported in history and we find uh, him reporting this narrative or uh, just one person from among those 40 students who reports this narrative from Zayd ibn Sabit is extremely strange and this is further compounded by the fact that in the, in the time of uh, Medina, there were many students which were present with him. So why is it just Ubaid ibn Sabbaq out of those 40 students reporting them. And again, in this regard, it needs to be understood that Zaid ibn Sabit, uh, that Ubaid ibn Sabbaq himself is a person who is not very well known. So remember I had pointed out that Karabisi, one of the uh, earliest, uh, um, earliest hadith critics, had said that Muhaddisun have put a question mark on the personality of who uh, Ubaid ibn Sabbaq is. And this this is uh, recorded by, uh, this, these words of Karabisi have been recorded by Al-Karabi in his Kabul al-Akhbar that uh, Karabisi has said that Muhaddis soon have pointed out that who is this Ubaid ibn Sabbaq. So he some, seems to be a very unknown person as well to the earliest Muhaddis soon. So all in all we find that not only there is a high probability of the fact that this narrative is broken or munkata between Ubaid ibn Sabbaq and Zaid ibn Sabit, it also uh, shows us that uh, Ubaid ibn Sabbaq himself is not a very well known person amongst the earliest authorities. And finally, viewers, we come to the eighth, eighth critique in this regard, and that is uh, that the central person of this report is Ibn Shahab al Zuhri. And Ibn Shahab al Zuhri, about whom we generally regard our Muhaddisun or our uh, scholars to have a very high regard. They give a very high regard to Ibn Shahab Zuri, and he's even regarded to be a middle mu'minin fil hadith. He's, he's the greatest champion of hadith. However, I presented an all, some alternative evidence on the basis of some of our previous scholars, previous authorities, who had pointed out that Ibn Shahab Zuri's personality is afflicted. It is, it is enigmatic. It is afflicted with a number of flaws. So he is guilty of tadlis. He is guilty of idraj, he is also probably guilty of irsal uh, and in general. And one can never say if this irsal, this tendency of irsal, this tendency of idraj uh, and this tendency of tadlis did not have any, uh, any, any influence in this narrative as well. And also we find that he is reporting the same fact in a in, 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 in different manner, in a different way to two different people when he would be very uh, fresh, he would report it differently and in a different way. And people would wonder that he is reporting the same fact to different people in a different way. So 
all in all, this cause casts serious doubt on the personality of Ibn Shahab Zuhri because he was a person, he is a central person, he's the focal point of this narrative. We find him to be the central person who reports this narrative the way it is reported uh, in various forms in our Hadith books. Not only that, we find that there are eight, eight of his students who report this narrative. So we have uh, Ibrahim ibn Sa'ad, we have Shoaib ibn Abi Hamza, we have Abdul Rahman ibn Khalid ibn Musafir, and we have uh, 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 Yunus ibn Yazid. And then extending them further by four people, we have uh, Mamur ibn Rashid, we have Sufyan ibn Ayana, we have Ubaidullah ibn Abi Ziyad, and finally uh, we have Ibrahim ibn Ismail. So we have these eight people reporting this narrative from Ibn Shahab Zuhri. And remember viewers that I had pointed out that none of these eight chains is reliable. None of these eight chains. So we can see there are serious problems with the Isnad. It, is, it, could, it in all probability is broken. The fact that Ubaid ibn Sabak is, is, a much, is not a very well known person. The fact that Ibn Shahab Zuhri's personality is afflicted with a number of flaws. The fact that the students, the eight students of Ibn Shahab Zuhri the chains of narration of all these eight students, the way they report this narrative from Ibn Shahab Zuri, all of them have serious flaws. So we can see that the isnad of this narrative is an amalgam of problems. It has huge problems. We have noted all, already the Daraya part in which we have found how this narrative is weakly reported. The, the contents are unreliable. Now in this second part, I have shown you that this narrative, the isnad of this, this narrative is also extremely weak, extremely unreliable. and we see clearly that this is, we cannot depend upon this Isnad. So viewers, if this is the case, if this is the situation that not only the mutton of this narrative has a number of questions, not only the Isnad of this narrative has a number of questions, then what can be done? What can be surmised? So my take on this is that on the basis of this narrative, the collection of the Quran, the way it is reported here in, by Imam Bukhari and by other, by other people, we cannot make any conclusion. We cannot accept this narrative the way it is. We simply cannot derive any historical uh, reliable data and we need to uh, reject this narrative in totality. When I say in totality, I say the way it reports things. However, viewers, uh, when, we, uh, when we reject this narrative, we cannot deny that something did happen in the time of Abu Bakr because the way things have been reported in history the way even a number of narratives which report this, this thing. There, there was some, some element, there was some part of uh, truth, there, there should be some part of truth there which was perhaps reported in this distorted form and which took a, a, the shape of a number of distortions. There, there has to be some, some semblance of an information <coughs> which we might regard as something which had happened. So if I, I would uh, uh, analyze this fact, I would con come to the conclusion keeping in view all the data and keeping in view that there are there is a set of narratives which I'm just going to put before you uh, in which uh, we find that there was something which Abu Bakr did for the cause of the Quran uh, then we can easily come to the conclusion or I can easily make this conclusion that perhaps what Abu Bakr did in his own times was to have the Quran personally collected with him in the form of a written codex that's all this is all what happened the rest of the details does not, they do not form any sort of uh, cogency or any form of reliability. Uh, as far as the collected Quran is concerned, all that we can make out of the fact is that perhaps it was a personal collection which was made by Abu Bakr in which he involved uh, maybe Zayd al Nisabit, maybe he would have involved other uh, people, but as it, it was nothing of the sort of an official connection, it was nothing of the sort of a, a problem which was arisen in those times. I have already pointed it out in my earlier sessions that although uh, the narratives say that it was the battle of Yamama because of which uh, Umar became alarmed that a number of memorizers have been lost. I have, I have analyzed yours earlier on and seen and shown you that this particular fact whether a number of memorizers were actually martyred or not is itself questionable. We cannot say they were a large number nor, ni neither can we say with certainty they were a few number. I had surmised earlier on that this is insufficient, there is insufficient data in history uh, which can tell us whether the number, number of memorizers was huge or not. We had not taken that particular point of critique into consideration. But again, as I said, if everything is put on the desk, if everything is analyzed, 
then the, then the, that the part that can be accepted in all of this uh, data is that perhaps Abu Bakr just went about making a personal collection of the Quran and the whole grand scheme of things in which the Quran was being transmitted by a number of individuals. Uh, it was being done as it was being done. As far as this narrative is concerned, it was, this, it was no, no case of alarm, no case of collection of the Quran by Zayd ibn Sabit as if he was doing something official on the part of the Caliph Abu Bakr. All that we can see is that he, Abu Bakr perhaps was the first person who could have collected the Quran in written form for his own personal reading or for his own personal use uh, and he, he could have been the first person. And when I say uh, well, uh, this, when I conclude this and I infer this, this is because of a uh, number of narratives uh, which I'm now just going to read out, a couple of narratives uh, they are and very short. Uh, and, and the important thing is, and, the, and the, the thing worthy of note here is that none of these narratives uh, is reported by Ibn Shahab Zori. We do not have Ibn Shahab Zori being mentioned in any of these narratives. Thus, for example, uh, we find uh, Muhammad ibn Sa'ad uh, in his at al-Kubra. He reports uh, this, fa uh, this narrative and the person who reports, uh, he records this narrative. And the person who reports is, is Ali Rizit Ala Anhu. And, and it is said, عن عبد خير علي قال يرحم الله أبا بكر هو أول من جمع اللوحين. So may God have mercy upon Abu Bakr uh, Ali رضي الله عنه says because he was the person who was the first person to collect the Quran between two covers. So this is how Ali has says this narrative. And again we have uh, 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 Abu Ubaid's uh, Fazail al Quran. We have this narrative mentioned there, and, and here it is reported by Abd Khair. So Abdul Khair says that Avvalu man jamal Quran bain lawhain Abu Bakr. The first person to, the, to collect the Quran between two, buck, two covers is Abu Bakr. Then we have the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, and we find Sa'asa ibn Suhan saying that Avvalu man jamal Quran wa warras al Kalala Abu Bakr. The first person to collect the Quran and give inheritance to Kalala was Abu Bakr. Then we have Amr ibn Shurahbil. Ashabi again this narrative is found in the Muqaddimatan uh, Filum al-Quran and the words are that Abu Bakr Avvaluman Jamal Musaf that he was the person who was responsible for collecting the Musaf between two covers. So all in all viewers uh, what best can be surmised from whatever has been mentioned regarding uh, uh, the event which had actually taken place or the happening which we can say with reasonable uh, certainty uh, to have happened in the times of the Caliph Abu Bakr was that perhaps he was the person who was, he, for his own personal reading, for his own personal uh, purposes, had collected the Quran you know, between two covers. That's all which can at best be gathered. Even this could be debatable, but this is what at best can be gathered. So uh, this is uh, what we have discussed in totality regarding the collection of the Quran in the times of the Caliph Abu Bakr. In the uh, next sessions, inshallah, we'll continue with this journey and see how uh, this collection of the Quran narrative, as has been recorded in the times of the Caliph Abu Bak uh, of uh, the Caliph Usman, we'll inshallah continue our journey and then analyze those reports. Kulukali Haza, wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisaril muslimina wal muslimat.